Next, Rock Mill was not just a grist mill, it was a place for commerce and companionship. Then, find out how front porch parties are creating dynamic, diverse communities. And take a look at Larry's, an iconic bar where beat poets and PhDs gathered in the university district. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by at American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications, think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Today we're at the Fawcett Center on Olentangy River Road. You've probably been here for a conference, or maybe you've come to visit us at WOSU because we're part of the Fawcett Center family. It's a great place because today we're talking about gathering spaces, not your home or your office, but those spots where you just love to hang out with friends and family. Our first story is about Rock Mill and how people gathered there in the past to grind flour and corn. And today, preservationists gather there to restore it as a recreational area. We're in Fairfield County, headed to one of my favorite places close to Columbus. Rock Mill is just a great place. This is a 19th century mill, been there forever. It was in terrible condition, but the county park system acquired it and did a great restoration. So we're going to learn a lot about water power and 19th century mill technology and how grain gets turned into flour. Hello. Hi, Jan. How are you? I'm Good doing well. Nice Jeff. to see you, Good Jeff to see Darby. You. Good to yeah. see you. How are you, yeah. Bruce? Nice to see you. Well, Rock Mill, this is uh, way different from what it was some years ago, isn't it? <laughs> sure is. I've been uh, looking forward to this visit. Let's let's have a look in the mill. I've Great. Uh, been excited about coming down here today. All right. When was the mill built? What was the what was the date? This particular mill was built in 1824. Okay. But the first mill that was built on the Hocking River in this area was 1799. So th is, this is the Hocking River? This is the okay. headwaters of the Hocking River, okay. which was the Hock Hocking River at that time. The Native American name. Right. So it's sited in wood. It has a heavy wood frame construction. Is that, uh, is that typical mill construction? Yeah, typical mill construction. When the grain first arrives, it would come into this area and you can see where there was a hoist beam up at oh, the top. Sure. Yeah, protected and by that little the roof. grain would be brought up in bags up to the, not the very top floor, but to the third floor level. Mm -hmm. And there it would be spread out on the floor where it could be dried and conditioned and then moved across to the east side of the mill where it would feed back down and into hoppers that would feed the millstone. Well, let's have a look inside. All right. Boy, it looks great, but I'm guessing it didn't always look this good. No. When, when we first got started, there were no floors in here. Oh, my. The place was overrun with possums, skunks, raccoons, squirrels. A lot of trash had been accumulated over the hundred years that it did sit here idle. Who owned the mill at the time? Bob Stapleton family mm -hmm. had the mill. Okay. 
and, and that family gave the mill to Fairfield County Historical yes. Parks. Bob d worked on it for about two years mm -hmm. himself. Okay. Every night he'd come work on it. And he finally realized this was a much bigger project than he could do. And that's when he gave it to the parks system mm -hmm. in the hopes that they could restore it. Had he not done some of the restoration to even start, oh, yeah. the mill would have fallen into the gorge. Yeah, it was in the hands of somebody who really it appreciated was. how important it, was, it really and, was and did what he could to take care of it. Right. Well, I see we have stones here. These are grindstones, yeah. I assume. These are the only two pieces that we were able to salvage out of the mill, which is one set of mill stones. This is the bed stone. This is the stone that sits on a hearse frame. Mm -hmm. It does not turn. Okay, so it's stationary. You can see there are grooves in, in this. It's called a dressing. Mm -hmm. And the mill right would dress those uh, after so many hours of operation to keep it sharp. They're not just grooves. One side is straight. The other is a chisel. Okay. So it, it grinds so the, the grain when, when, it's, okay. when it's turning. Okay. This stone is the turning stone. And it picks up and it sets on top of this stone. I would guess it doesn't pick up very easily. There no. must be several This weighs pounds. about 650 pounds. That was my guess, something like and that. And when we go down below, you'll see the new stones that we have. They're not new, but they're newer stones that are in there. Over here, we've got this set of stones opened up so you can see it. Here you can see Jan talked about a bed stone. This one you can see, it's just set solid right there. This is the runner stone that's on top. This is the crane that would oh, be used to, yeah, to raise yeah. and, and lower it. Here you see the little spout uh, where the flour or cornmeal would go down. So it would naturally accumulate and then slip down through that. Right. And then this um, piece here, this metal piece, that, that's what, that must be powered from beneath. That's right. And that's it turns what's the upper powered stone. by the water wheel. Okay. Okay. And this little point right here supports that entire wheel. Oh, I there's see just, there, yes. It's just balanced in there. Well, the mill is, is water powered, but boy, there's an awful lot of human effort as well. There is. <laughs> yep. Not everything is water powered. That's right. That's right. Well, that's fascinating. Well, speaking of water power, I can, I can hear the splashing outside. So there's more to see, isn't there? There is. Okay. There's a lot more to see. Let's yep. go have a look. All right, so we're down one level below the grinding floor, the milling floor. And obviously, this is the main source of power. Right. Yeah. This is the floor that changes the horizontal motion to the vertical. Mm -hmm. So this is all new construction all based new construction. on historic precedent, historic design. It was right. done by a millwright who actually reconstructs historic mills. Right. This entire structure is not attached to the mill. Okay. It sets independent because when we're grinding, this structure tends to want to move. Right. And we don't want the mill. You want it isolated, it. yeah. So it's these, all isolated. And these uh, gears obviously run the stones. Right. And you can tell with the, the speed of the pinion gear here, once you engage these gears, these must really spin. Right. This steel shaft that you see when uh, uh, Jan was pointing out that point yes. that supports the, right. uh, right. the stone, that is that piece right there. That point is on that. So there's some sort of bearing here where it goes up through the floor. That's right. So the whole weight of that top stone sets on that, on that bearing down there, and that's how... As he pointed out, this can raise it up and down and get that fine adjustment uh, for grinding what sort of, flour. What sort of horsepower are we talking about? That about like 20. This and that's and enough to run the, that'll run the whole mill. Yep. I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. Well, I know there's more. It doesn't sound like very much. But. <laughs> well, it, that's, they figured it out, didn't they? So now we're, oh, we're walking right over the flume. Oh my, look at this. We're right on top of the flume. The water's there's, flowing right underneath. Right, and there's the right wheel, there's the main feet. gear. Wow, what a sight, 26 foot wheel. That is big. <laughs> right now, we, since we don't have the dam built, we pump water into okay. this reservoir. Okay, yeah. And then it comes over and into the four bay box. So you will rebuild the dam? We will. Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, we're trying to, <laughs> it's not easy to get a permit to build a dam on the Hocking River. Yeah, I'm gonna guess that's the case. But we're, we're gonna, that's our goal. Well, history will prevail, right? It's our goal. <laughs> well, you certainly know a lot and you've certainly given me a lot of information today. I wanna thank you for just a great visit. 
I learned a lot myself. We are uh, glad to have you really here. Well, glad I'm glad to have you here. So, I am so you. glad the county uh, took on this project. Uh, the, the county park system, they've done a terrific job and it, it only promises a lot of good things for the future. Next, porch parties in the Old Oaks neighborhood. Then, Larry's Bar, a place where everybody knew your name, at least while you studied at OSU. The Old Oaks neighborhood is enjoying a revival, from home restoration and renovation to close-knit neighbors who celebrate the seasons together. And one of the ways the neighbors got to know each other is Wednesdays on the Porch, a simple porch gathering that has been the highlight of the neighborhood. I'm in the Old Oaks neighborhood attending a monthly porch party. It's a great way for me to get to know the residents and the neighborhood a little better. David Gray is the president of their neighborhood association and has lived in this neighborhood for over 20 years. These great porch parties in Old Oaks, how did they start? How long have they been going on? How do you organize them? Well, it started about 20 years ago. My wife uh, wanted to organize some of the neighbors to get together on porches and make it low key. Um, meeting on the porch meant that you didn't have to worry about cleaning the house and you could just have people come over for lemonade and, and cookies and uh, start after work on a Wednesday from 7 to 9 and uh, just kind of took off from there. I, I didn't think it would be a great idea, but uh, I got to say I was totally wrong because now we actually have a waiting list for people to who sign up for it. But we ask people that if they've hosted before, if they wait till other people have a chance. Is it strictly social or do you actually conduct business? We wanted it to not to be business. We have a civic association that deals with that, and sometimes business issues can be contentious. So we wanted this to be really just relaxed and ask how your day was going. Well, having um, been privileged enough to attend one or two, I have to say it is the friendliest, warmest, most diverse group of neighbors I've met anywhere in the city. Well, that means a lot because I, I think when you listen to the media or read what's happening in, in, the, in the country today, you, you would think that everybody seems to be very divisive. But I think our neighborhood is an anomaly to that, and I like to think that all neighborhoods are like ours. I'm not sure if they are or not, but we certainly have a wide spectrum of, of, of backgrounds here, and, uh, and everybody gets along and respects one another's opinions, and, and it's just a great neighborhood to live in. David, tell me a little bit about the history of the neighborhood. Where does the term Old Oaks come from, and what kind of a neighborhood was this when it was being built? I believe that it's a made-up name when they became a historic district in the late uh, 1980s. The history of the neighborhood is, uh, is very interesting. Livingston Avenue, when it was electrified, enabled people not to have to live right above their shop or within walking distance of where they worked. They could actually live in what they called the suburb. This was really the suburbs and it was one of Columbus's first suburbs because then they could get on the electrified streetcar, which was streetcar number one, and oddly enough, it's still uh, Coda bus line number one. So people from German Village who lived above their shop could actually live out here and get rid of the, uh, the crampness of German Village, which is odd because what we find quaint and very much attractive about German Village now was not so great back then. It was, they were, houses were close, it was cramped, and the river probably didn't smell so well either, so they wanted to get away from that. So who would have lived here then? Well, certainly a lot of Germans, and there was uh, German Catholics, and they built the Holy Rosary St. John Church on Ohio, and there was also uh, a German Jewish people that came here, and they certainly would have been upper class. The fellow who uh, built this house was uh, Gephardt Jaeger who invented the cement mixer. When did the neighborhood start to change? I think like most neighborhoods across America, right after the war, with all the people coming back, they had to have housing and, and, and they wanted newer housing and so they kept moving further out into the suburbs which kind of depleted uh, what you had in the uh, urban core of Columbus. And then the houses were so big that some of them were chopped up to boarding houses or rental houses and the decay kind of started from there. Were there also racial divides as to when people could uh, find housing? Uh, was this, uh, for instance, an all-white neighborhood at some point in the 20s, as many Columbus neighborhoods were? Mm -hmm. And did that, when did that start to change? 
where there is a diversity of people. Well, you know, un un unfortunately, again, like every city in, in, in uh, across the country, I, I believe they did have that where you had, um, and I'm not sure what the technical name is, but, but you could only sell to, to certain people. The deed restrictions. Yes, and unfortunately that did not include minorities to be able to buy these houses. That particular uh, changed when they put the highway in, and I talked to some of the people who were brought up here in the 40s and 50s and, and 60s and said that in a matter of a couple years when they put the highway in, you had the white flight, and it changed from a white neighborhood to a minority neighborhood in just the course of a couple years in the early 60s. Ohio Representative Herschel Craig grew up in the Old Oaks neighborhood and tells the story about how jobs and affordable housing stabilize the neighborhood. So tell me about your connection to the neighborhood and how you started here. My mother uh, moved here in the uh, middle 60s. You know, it was a very mixed community in, in, in many ways. The neighborhood began to change when you would come back from college? Over time. Right. But here's the thing. Uh, my mother literally could walk to a job. So the Xerox uh, Corporation owned a, uh, a boundary plant. There were a number of other uh, factories and work locations on this site. When the industry began to shift, when the economy began to change, yeah. it began to shift in many ways what the community looked like. What I'm also deeply concerned about is this issue about affordable housing mm -hmm. um, and making sure that we have balance in terms of homeowners and those that have to rent to provide for their families. Do you think our best bet is to have these conversations at a neighborhood level with other people about affordable housing? Or are we looking to the elected officials to try to find programs that help relieve this? Well, I think both. I don't think elected officials should be making decisions in a vacuum or a silo. So I spend an awful lot of time with our civic associations, our area commissions, and listening to them, these folks every month are, are invested in these communities come out and make sure uh, that they have conversations about affordable housing, our education for their children, uh, and employment opportunities. This neighborhood is now attracting a new generation of homeowners. Pamela Wachlowski and Brandon Wilburn recently purchased the neighborhood's most famous home, a house built in the 1850s by Carolyn Brown, an emancipated slave. We found this home listed and had such an interest in it just because it was beautiful and had all this history and we took a look at it and loved it and then it was just a bonus that the neighborhood was such a great place. I think the porch gatherings are fantastic. They're such a wonderful way to meet neighbors, see old faces, see new faces. There's always people coming into the neighborhood and moving in and so it's just a great way to know who is living next door to you. Not only that, but a lot of people also have older homes, you know, the similar age homes, and they've also undertaken projects that you might want to be undertaking yourself, and so you can reach out to them and ask them, how do I do something? It's something different that I haven't experienced in other Columbus neighborhoods. Um, even living over in uh, German Village for a while, I'd, you know, wave at the neighbors, but I didn't know them by their first name. I didn't know about their, their job or their children or what they might be working on. What's the prognosis for the neighborhood now? Well, I think it's, it's to the point where it's the tipping point where you know, there's a lot of people here that um, have a sense of community and they keep adding to that. Um, and that. And that's a good thing. So I see the neighborhood as far as having younger people and who are even having their children and instead of moving away when they have children, choosing to bring their children up here in the neighborhood. And, and th those are good things. It's a lovely neighborhood with great gardens and friendly people. Truly, it's going in the right direction, and we, we all appreciate that. And, and, and the nice thing is, is that I think people are sensitive to the downside of when a neighborhood starts to improve, and we try very hard to help people. The University District has undergone some drastic changes. Bookstores have given way to noodle shops and many of the iconic bars are long gone. Larry's Bar was one of those one-of-a-kind spots that marked the end of an era when it closed down. But fear not, the Ohio History Connection kept many of its artifacts, including the sign.
Hey, Matt. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I know it's a cliche to start a conversation this way, but what's your sign? <laughs> this is the sign for uh, Larry's Bar, an iconic campus area bar that existed from about the 1920s up through 2008. And a lot of people here in Columbus watching would recognize this sign, is that correct? I think so. A lot of people are very familiar with the sign. It was on High Street right along in the uh, student bar area. Kind of stood out a little bit from the other student bars in that it attracted a different clientele. Um, a lot of neighborhood people, uh -huh. um, graduate students, professors, mm -hmm. and just people who were uh, just in the area and wanted to stop by and have a relaxing time. I understand Larry's has a connection with poetry. Yes, they started a poetry night in 1984, and that ran all the way to the end in 2008. It uh, resulted in having a lot of local poets and some national poets come by, and it actually, they put out Larry's Poetry Review, a publication that contained the poems. Huh. Well, another figure I've heard appeared at Larry's was kind of a poet, but a musician too, Phil Oakes. Phil Oakes is supposedly rumored to have had one of his first gigs there as part of a duo before he became a national folk singer while well, he's still a student at Ohio State. Yeah, and for a while he kind of rivaled Dylan as the voice of his generation. That's true. So who owned this bar? It's owned by the Paletti family. They were uh, area restaurateurs. They had other restaurants. In fact, Larry started as the Lawrence Grill at Fifth and High, and in the 1920s the family moved it down to its final location in the campus area. And the, the family that had the bar also had a connection with another well-known Columbus family. Yes, they were related through marriage to one of the Marzettis of the family that uh, had the Marzetti restaurant and, of course, the Marzetti salad dressings. People know that product for sure. What else do you have for us? Well, Well, this looks like more uh, food items. Yes, these are some from some campus area restaurants that have been very famous over time. Again, people who went to campus or lived in that area would know these. Oh yes, very well. So Matt, tell us about uh, these menus, about this one here on top. Sharbert's was a campus institution that was located near the old Long's bookstore by 15th Avenue. It was a famous hangout. It had lots of different things for people to eat during the day. Was it mostly a student hangout? Were there uh, other folks there too? I think the students did like going there a lot. One interesting note is that um, the Char Bar is its ah, sister restaurant. I see. And it's still around. I see. Okay, great. Uh, let's show, show us another menu. Here's Talita's, which was originally up on North High toward Clintonville. Mm -hmm. And it was a very popular Brownsville style Mexican restaurant, Brownsville, Texas. Mm. And it was there for a long time. I think it was one of the first places you could get Mexican food I, in the I, Columbus area. Uh, I don't doubt it, yeah. And here's a menu from the Blue Danube. Uh, the original restaurant was there for years and years and years. That's right, it was a long time campus institution. It's um, well known to people. Their parents went there, their grandparents went uh -huh. there. People have gone, kept going to it for a long time. Right, and what was the, I love the uh, cigarette burn. That seems yeah. so appropriate on this it's menu. very authentic. Yes, and what was the special dish there? Well, they had something called the Dube Dinner Deluxe, which uh, involved a bottle of champagne and two grilled cheese sandwiches. Well, that sounds perfect. <laughs> well, Matt, these uh, menus are great because they show us that uh, this area has always been thriving. There have been a lot of changes, but it's always been a popular area and a place that people have uh, visited quite a bit. That's correct. Well, thanks for sharing these with us. Thank you for coming. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods.
Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.